The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you say. On the talk station, Faith Matters. And welcome to our program today, Faith Matters on the talk station. I'm Ben Ball and joined today with Reverend Robert Cornegie and Bishop Doc Loomis. And as we get set to talk about some of the events of uh, recent times and some of the articles and newspaper articles and other articles online uh, around it. And a uh, good day, gentlemen. Hope everyone's well. Good morning, Ben. Let's good take, to be here, Ben. Let's take a look at what's going on. Uh, and, of course, in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, since uh, even since we recorded our last show, we had some very um, uh, tragic things go on with the shooting in Dallas and also a lot of uh, uh, maybe a higher level of discussion going on about race relations and relations between law enforcement and the citizenry of, of, of various groups as well too and so to look at that i was uh i f- sought out and found a, an opinion piece here written in the christian post and it's called 10 candid thoughts on race policing and violence in america by michael brown and to preface this he begins by saying as america stands at the prefaces of deadly and coast-to-coast race wars that this is not the time to mince words. I would rather speak truth in love, even if it means offending some, than avoid confrontation out of fear of offense in return. I expect others to be just as candid with me. Now, he also quotes Professor George Yancey here, and I think this is instructive. He's himself an African-American has also urged for open, candid conversation, saying, maybe now with people on all sides of the political and racial arguments feeling such pain, we can begin by taking the necessary steps to move towards real racial reconciliation. Before we get to the comments that he that he brings up or the the uh, uh, quotes or some and that he reacts to. Let me just start with that that um, principle here. That uh, maybe now with people on all sides feeling such pain. Robert, do you think that's an accurate assessment of where we are? <clears throat> yeah, I do. I think that's pretty good. Uh, um, I actually know Michael Brown, and and he has been a commentator on uh, a number of these issues in a powerful voice. He doesn't hold back. And uh, he uh, get, usually cuts right to the chase on these kind of things. So I think he's speaking pretty um, insightfully and discerning what what this what is happening in our country that a lot of the the um, the veneer mm-hmm. of the Civil Rights Act and to try to get along and try to work. This is a generational process you know we're making progress and uh, you know that that's kind of been the current there was momentum mm-hmm. that we were making progress in this country in ter- in terms of these um, uh, racial racial divide racial divide right. and now all of a sudden it's just blown up and uh, so everybody's feeling pain on this one if you're not then you better go have a checkup real quick because uh, something's wrong Cause, but but we're also looking at uh, mm-hmm. that that brings us to the point where he comes to a point where now sides are feeling if there were sides truly sides that were established that they are all feeling pain it's interesting because we look at say uh, the latest incidents in Baton Rouge in Minnesota that require investigation that you know are not necessarily clear on their face uh, but require investigation, some you know, more so than others, mainly because we have video present. But then we have the situation in Dallas, which was very clearly, and and Dallas being a, a, something that also for us of a generation too also brings other things to mind, but very clearly an assassination that was going on of, uh, of police. Uh, but it does, uh, uh, Bishop, uh, uh, Doc, does this, does this bring us to a point where maybe we can not just talk at each other, but with each other? I'm, w- let me just tell you what I'm afraid of. What, what I'm afraid of is that um, 
the cream that rises to the top of the milk in this is this, this milk of pain is anger. Mm-hmm. It's a small, uh, it's a relatively small uh, part of the whole, but. W- uh, yes, there's pain on both sides, but there's also an increased or more intensified anger on both sides right now. And that's mm-hmm. the part that concerns me. Um, you see that uh, – you can actually see that a little bit in the um, in the Muslim Muslim and Muslim relationships between Sunni and Shia. Mm-hmm. You've got generally a lot of people who've been through an awful lot, and, and they would say that we're in an awful lot of pain. But there's a small cream at the top of that that's very angry uh, with the other side. And I think that's what we're seeing right now in the white-black relationships or the police and black relationships is there's an intensification of the anger at the very top and what needs to happen. And I think what Michael – Michael Brown's a radio host. I don't trust anything I hear on the radio, but I will tell you that in this case, I think he's right. Mm-hmm. And his call is to those of us that are feeling pain to do what needs to be done to squash the anger, mm-hmm. to – to make it go away, to talk them through it, or to physically say enough and stop it. Because it's always at that level. It's always the level of the anger and the cream that this violence occurs. It's not happening between, I have a black son. He's not angry at me. I'm not angry at him. I don't walk down the street angry at black Americans. But there are black Americans who are angry at police officers right now. Mm -hmm. And there are white Americans who are angry at blacks who are angry at whites right now. And that's where we as a society need to turn. The milk needs to turn and Mm -hmm. fix that little piece. So, so uh, we need to pay attention both to ourselves and to our, 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 our groups, you know, internally, and then also reach across externally. Well, there has to be a large pressure if if there are a lot of black people who are feeling pain right now, mothers in Chicago whose kids are getting shot, families in Greenville whose kids are getting shot through the wall of their house, if they're really angry, then they need to turn uh, toward these Black Lives Matters extremists and say, no, no, not so much. This is not what we want. We don't want to kill pigs. We want you to calm down and let's talk to each other. Let's pray for and each other. And many of them are doing that. Oh, yeah. that's the beauty. But the right. white, yeah. we have to do it on the white yeah. side. Yeah, the media, unfortunately, <clears throat> you know, that's the – on the evening news, that's often the last story of the evening news is they try to throw in a little feel-good thing, and they'll talk about that. But many of those that are suffering because of the loss, because of the deaths, <clears throat> I was just reading that one the son of – <clears throat> the one in Minnesota, I think it is. Right. Yeah. Right. Has come out and said, please do not go to violence. This is the last thing we should do on this. Well, and, that's often the call, though, from those who are closest to yeah. it, I think. But uh, but as as, Mike, uh, as Michael Brown says here, one of his statements, all black lives matter, not just the lives of blacks who died at the hands of white cops. White, uh, white critics have rightly asked, where are the rallies and protests when a three-year-old black child dies from a random inner-city gunfire? And what about the disproportionate number of black babies killed in the womb, not to mention blacks killed by other blacks? A black man named Richard wrote on Facebook, we cannot pick and choose when we decide to make a stand. So that's a pretty uh, far-reaching statement, I think, right there. Since we either are all in, um, we must address black-on-black crime in addition to the murder of innocent blacks, or we're not in at all. We can't let these race-baiting politicians further divide us. If you haven't noticed, they want a race war. We must stand up and unite both black and white and whatever other ethnicity and reclaim our freedom. Uh, a powerful comment there, it's, but but we are also what? But what about this now? Um, uh, we see so much now. What has changed since the civil rights movement uh, of the of the sixties? What's changed of when we started seeing more, even the equality and other efforts throughout the seventies and eighties? Is social media has changed, and the, the way we get and disseminate information has changed. Now, mm-hmm. we saw a death. On Facebook Live, yeah, you know that changes the conversation to something that starts immediately. And as Doc, to your point, that often begins in anger. Those yes. conversations, yeah. and that's what's tough to get a handle on. But, but the, I mean, let's be honest. We're really not angry about death. You know, the the the, the group is Black Lives Matter, but um, we're really not angry about the death part. When it that is black lives matter, what what we're really angry about, it seems to me, is we're angry about the the continued feeling that 
that the black man has been subjugated, that there's still racism in this country. That's the anger part, is the mm-hmm. racism part. If it was just death, then we would all be angry in Chicago, and we'd be angry in Greenville, and we'd be angry in South Carolina at a church. We'd all be angry about that. But that we're not. But as but as as Black Lives Matter folks, what we're what, what they seem to be really angry about is uh, the racism that continues. Mm-hmm. That Am they, I wrong on this? Or it, that there's a different set of rules? Yeah. Well, exactly that. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we have the the way of approaching this. You know, we went through the. We're all old enough to have gone through this the the whole 60s and 70s and the the whole race stuff going on and and remember it very well and remember uh martin luther uh, yeah martin luther king jr and his insistence on it being done in a particular way nonviolence, and well. that it that what we're really looking at is not to judge by the color of skin but the, the content of character and that our there is a respect and a and a, a and a process that we have to go through when we approach these disparities in our culture and racism, and so we, that seems to have disappeared hmm. to a degree in this in the debate right now. Now my prayer as believers is that we're gonna we're gonna insist on that coming back. More to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station FM 107 and AM 1240 as we continue here on the program, and we hope that you'll stick around and join us. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And joined again uh, today by Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Robert Cornegy. We were talking in the first segment. We'll continue that uh, discussion here in this segment uh, from the Christian Post. And uh, it was a column by uh, Michael Brown. Uh, we should give a little of his um, provenance, I guess. His, he, is, he has a Ph.D. in Near Eastern Languages and, and uh, Literatures from New York University radio show and he is a jewish believer in jesus uh his uh, i think is how he described it right yeah, he knows something about being a minority yeah <laughs> so uh let's let's pick up a couple of his points where he writes in this article he writes uh, 10 different points that are worthy of discussion should be points of discussion in his mind uh, number five was everyone that must work together to address injustice and equality wherever it raises its head uh, be it in the courts or in the streets I know one of the things that's always bothered me about uh, uh, racism in in this country is that uh, is that somebody will decline to speak on about a subject because they think that a, another person in the room might be offended by that, or they will or they'll say something. They'll look around, you know, or the, you know, you, you've been in a crowd of white guys who will say a joke, and they, but they look around to see who's standing there. And said, well, well, what about me? You know, I'm offended by it. Mm-hmm. I'm offended by your right. your your talk. So uh, we have to have. Uh, I think his point there is that we have to we have to have more people who are offended by uh, what others may per- perceive as being in our social group uh, and acting in ways that are unjust. Mm-hmm. Doc, what, what do you think? Well, it's you know it's really hard when you're in a room. Um, uh, I happen to be a white guy. If I'm in a room and somebody tells a racial joke about another ethnic group, uh, growing up as a white guy, I mean, I, nobody's racist. Okay, there are no there are no racist babies. I was with, I'll tell you, I was with my granddaughter the other day, and um, we were trying to describe a little kid that we had met uh, at at human services, and she just looks out. She's five years old, and she just looks at me and said, "Grandpa, what well, what color was she?" <laughs> All right. Later on, she'll figure out that skin pigmentation makes people smarter or dumber or something because somebody's going to teach her that. Mm. Somebody's going to say that she's better than somebody because she's white. It's always something that is. It's something that has to be learned. And uh, we're talking about during the break. This is one of the challenges: is that God had an absolute plan for how we were to live, and that that plan was uh, not that black lives mattered or white lives mattered, but that we didn't kill people. We just didn't do it. 
And Robert, I think you said a little earlier that there are some absolutes that we have to gather around as a church. So if we've got a society full of people that are teaching one thing, and if I'm uncomfortable in a room where somebody tells an ethnic joke and I don't laugh because I want to fit in or whatever my training is as the, as the junior racist that I am, if the church isn't doing its part in teaching against racism, isn't actually teaching what it is that God has said about how we are to treat one another, then we are all going to be left to the devices of our, our homes and our families and the guys in the room telling the ethnic jokes until we finally are convinced that, hey, I'm a pretty good racist. Mm. This is a, sadly, this is a place where the church has really come apart. We see it even here where we've got racially divided churches. It's very sad. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, as we often say, how many races are there? Well, there's only one. You know, it's a human race, and uh, the the differences that we put in, that we in our social cultural um, distortions because of the fall. I mean, the original division of the of was not based on color; it was based on language. When after the Tower of Babel, that was a language mm-hmm. division, and the purpose of that was to stop this process of man thinking that he's smarter than God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't based on skin color or any of that stuff. It was based on language. That was what God did. And so now, you know, we're seeing in, in America, the American dream has always been this ideal that our rights, our as a human being, our, our rights were given to us by God directly not passing as we've talked often Mm -hmm. not passing through the government the purpose of the government Mm -hmm. was to protect those rights and we've lost that sense and now we have this sense that the government is the only one that can fix this and and that's not the original picture the original picture was that our relationship with god and that in that relationship with God, those rights, that there is a responsibility that comes along with that, that internal governance, that we govern ourselves. And, and we're, we've kind of lost that vision in our country. And how do we get that back? And if the church, that's what the church is supposed to teach, is that our freedoms, our liberties come from God, not from mm-hmm. government. And and when you think the opposite of that, we, we've got this choice now. We either can follow God or we can follow government. And so we're seeing this this division. And I, I'm being you know mm-hmm. hyperbolic a bit, but you know we have you know there there are places where they share responsibilities in the process. But somehow, if we don't get back to that, did you hear the Bush um, President Bush's? Um, at the uh, service, at I listened service. to some of. Uh, I've just heard some extended clips from both of them. Yes, yeah, both yeah. Uh, presidents. Yeah, and I did. I, I listened to the whole thing, and uh, it was it was phenomenal. Um, some of the points that were made by both of them made some very good points. There were some other points that were made as well that were not quite as good. But um, but you know that whole idea. What is it that we can center around? What is it that's going to bring about the kind of reconciliation that we're we're hoping for? Because we're divided. Yeah. Well, that's that's the age old challenge. I mean, the devil is that that is his job. I mean, exactly. that's what he does. Right. You know, what, regardless liar. of what you think about the devil, he's a disperser, mm-hmm. and God is a gatherer. God has always wanted us united. He's given us a way to do it. He's given us a son to follow. He's given us a way to be united. And 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 the devil's very active right now trying to divide us he divides the church he divides the races he divides everything it just that's kind of what he does and until the church stands up to the devil uh resist yeah well you know i think a lot of us uh have have heard we we actually heard over and over again uh to be colorblind or to not see colors this is I, I'm not sure I buy that. I, I'm not sure that I buy that we that we might that we should try to pretend like we don't see the differences between people's uh, skin color, pigmentation, growing up, uh, um, their backgrounds, any number of things. That but instead that we embrace them. 
uh, we find a way to 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 not to not make that a determining point, not make that a wall that we must. It's like going into a field and gathering flowers. Yeah. You know, you can gather all of one kind if you want, but you have the opportunity to gather many kinds and to appreciate them all and, Mm -hmm. you know, put them all together. I think that's the way God kind of tends to look at his world. And I wish as Christians we would adopt that worldview. Well, yeah, you know, and I think what we get into, it's real easy to get into the difference between apologetics and polemics. And apologetics is where you're defending uh, the truth. You're you're coming from a, a... you know, explaining, giving a reason for the for the truth, what we believe is revelation truth. Um, polemics is when you attack the other person's position, and and uh, in in um, you know in our discussions with those that are coming from a different side, our our best approach to this is to explain, to present the truth of our position, not attack their position, because what are they going to do? Uh, they always go defensive, right. and they, and they right. they're always going to react. It's just like you don't that. win. You don't win the Christian, and over. they may you even do it somebody to over your, in an argument. Yeah, I mean, this is this is Peter. Peter talking. You know, Peter was the guy that couldn't keep his mouth shut and was always aggressive and all of that. And and God completely changed this guy once mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit got in his life. He became a different kind of guy, and he starts talking about being prepared to give a reason and to do it with gentleness and respect by Peter. Is that coming from Peter? He was transformed. And, and that is the thing. Once you tell the truth. So I'm, the point I'm making is that the purpose of the church is to bear witness to the truth. That's what Jesus came well, and, to do. And to battle the true enemy. I mean, once we understand that we're not actually at war with each other, it gets so much easier. Well, here, yeah. it's me, not power. Let me, let me offer an example of that because I think it goes back to a couple, uh, several weeks ago, a month or so ago, when with the Orlando shootings. Is that what we need to have as Christians and those who may oppose our position in an LGBT community is that we are on the same side against evil. Correct. That we need to be joined together against an evil force, and racism is an evil force. That we need to look at this. As uh, as it's both uh, whether it's police and black white uh, other you know these groups together is that racism is the evil <clears throat> it's not the individuals yeah that's right and how do you, you know we know that that I mean <laughs> we know that there's a blindness mm-hmm. that's there that there is there is a distortion of being able to see we just, just before we can't see clearly until we are set free well that was that's what's at the bottom of the pope's uh amoris laetitia was this uh, as it applies to families and lgbt and everybody else but we're fighting we're fighting the wrong things we need to, there needs to be a grace that is exhibited among the church and we have to realize that our common enemy is the devil yeah yeah but they 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 not only do we need to model the truth we need to speak the truth. We have to do both. And so that's where I think, as you're saying, um, Doc, that the failing of the church to do both, that we haven't modeled it well and we haven't spoken it well. Amen. You can uh, see this article uh, in the Christian Post on the opinion section uh, from uh, Michael Brown and uh, read more of the points that he has to make as well. We'll have more to talk about here in just a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240 with Robert Cornegy and, and Bishop Doc Loomis. And, and, you know, we were just during the break there. We were, we were saying, do you want to be in Cleveland? And, Robert, you're saying you wouldn't want to be there. Well, I'm talking a little bit about the Republican platform. You said, no, you, you wouldn't want to be there for anything, huh? No, no. I like watching it on TV. I really do. <laughs> this guy, uh, well, he won't even go to the seafood festival. He no. I, like, he doesn't like crowds. I just, I'm not a crowd person. Uh-huh. I just don't. 
I don't, I don't do crowds very well. So. Well, uh, you can also watch it on your mobile app now, too. Yes, that's true. 360 degree cameras. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll watch it from afar. I was proposing that they have a they have a that. camera as if it were from uh, from Donald Trump's viewpoint, where you could see the hair coming over the lens. A bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, I'm that would be put good. the GoPro up there. <laughs> the, oh the hair GoPro. <laughs> Uh, but on a serious note, this week is the is the week when they are uh, establishing the rules and the platform committees, and that has been a point of contention in uh, in leading up to this point. Even though platforms, we all know, the political platforms end up being pretty meaningless once the nominee is named. Uh, the but in the Daily Signal for this week, uh, they had one article that said social conservatives declare victory on bathrooms, marriage, and GOP platform. After fending off attempts to change the Republican Party's official position on LGBT issues and traditional marriage, a coalition of social conservatives cautiously celebrated an early victory Monday afternoon. Before the grand old party picks its presidential nominee formally, a select set of delegates on the platform committee will spend the week staking out Republican positions and everything from domestic to international issues uh, definitively. On the social issue front, the Republican platform, conservatives maintained a strict definition of marriage as between being a man between a man and a woman, and they limited the use of single sex bathrooms in public buildings to those of the same biological sex. And they defeated efforts to steer the party in a direction more in line with LGBT advocacy groups. Um, the the some of the reaction has been that they have actually turned back some of the changes they made just a few years ago in their in their platform. Uh, Robert, are they on the right track? Well, as a Christian constitutionalist mm -hmm. <laughs> who believes in um, absolutes from God, I th think they're on the right track. I believe that that mar the, the mar definition of marriage is exclusive to male female marriage. Mm -hmm. So that's the very definition of the word. So to say a same-sex marriage to me is an kind of an oxymoron. They, they, even though this is so, uh, even though this is supposedly settled law now, yeah. under the Supreme Court. Well, uh, see, I'm in the same position with abortion. It's a settled law by the Supreme Court, but I do not believe it's correct. And so, uh, you know, I believe that God has absolute truths and so when you start we were talking about it the other night with in the group that truth is is tr truth does not change feelings change but truth does not change our feelings about truth may change but the actual truth you know the scripture says um, the scriptures cannot be broken they are set they this is universal truths and so when you when you start playing with universal truths you there are consequences to doing that so you know it's a political it's a political discussion and politics is the art of compromise and uh, you know our our good friend mark uh, you know was very much an advocate for the this dialectic approach to determining truth that there are no absolutes that everything's negotiable which it fits right into the political worldview is that you come up with the thesis and the antithesis and you work mm -hmm. towards synthesis you you compromise those things and I, bible doesn't say that bible says when it says thus saith the Lord, <laughs> yeah, it has been it pretty well nails it down. <laughs> okay, I, in, this article goes on to uh, talk about someone that I frankly had not heard of before. And uh, Doc, maybe you uh, know who this is: billionaire Republican Paul Singer. Uh, and uh, and um, according to the New York Times, his group American Unity Fund, along with log cabin Republicans, aimed to hammer new gay rights planks into the platform. You familiar well, with good him? for them. Yes, yeah. he's uh, he's not exactly what you call a conservative Republican. He's been uh, working to advance minority uh, LGBT rights for quite a long time. He put several million dollars into trying to woo the uh, Republicans into building a few planks into the platform. Mm -hmm. the, the funny thing about that is both he and the people, the Log Cabin Republicans is another group, uh, are seem to be very upset that there was even a, dis a platform discussion about this. Did you notice that in the article? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They seem to be frustrated by it. And I think, 
you know, and I thought the response that the uh, the author had here was quite good, and that's look. Uh, President Barack Obama's bathroom directive was the first shot. Yeah, these are just people saying no and heck no, we're not we're not going to do that. I don't know what the frustration is. I don't th- at this point where we are as a na- you know you think of the great platforms that have come through society. Um, Martin Luther's uh, ninety five mm-hmm. theses would be mm-hmm. a great example of a, of a platform in the church stand from a church standpoint but then uh, the the new deal as it came as it came rolled out was another platform or now even, our or pla- even new gingrich uh, contract with contract america contract with yeah, america great society we've had million bunches of them yeah but this is not this our uh, now it uh nowadays platforms are really minutely constructed mm-hmm. every little thing every little agenda gets placed in them instead of being large planks a chicken in every pot is one way to say it mm-hmm. and now we say now now platforms are just this is the kind of minutia that platforms are built out of but it's very clear that they're taking a high profile situation about which the conservatives have very strong views and this is not so much an anti LGBT thing as it is an anti Barack Obama thing. Mm-hmm. This Absolutely. is this is a states' rights yeah. thing. Yeah, and, and well, the and the Washington Post uh, had said that this was not the way the direction that uh, 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 Reince Priebus, uh, the Republican National Committee chairman, wanted it to go. Uh, he was hoping that after Romney's loss, that they would rewrite a more um, general, broader uh, platform. Uh, broad, broader, inclusive, big tent platform, right? Uh, so, so, but but as as you said, Robert, you know, if this conforms more with what we understand to be truths, then uh, then you you can be okay with this. Look, it's uh, it's a bunch of this political stuff is just based on common sense. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there, this is that common when we talk about common sense. You know, we're talking about a, a, a majority view primarily. Common sense is what's common. I mean, that's what it is. And so how do you look at these things? Should, should boys and girls have to be concerned about going into the bathroom at their school or at their, their sports facility or wherever it is that someone's going to come in and, of a, you know, be a threat to them in some way? And so, you know, the clear, I mean, I think, you know, you, it all boils down to let's try to make sure our platform is based, the platform issues that we're going to talk about, um, you know, that we're, the, the Republican platform is a pro-life, has a pro-life plank in it. Um, the pro- Republican platform has a pro-business plank in it. It mm-hmm. has a um, positives rather than negatives. And so, you know, I think the positive one is towards safety, towards protection, towards cherishing, towards nurturing, taking care of the mm-hmm. weaker ones in our society. Well, the, the challenge with the planks as they sit right now, the, you know, what I would love to hear more of, and no one's asking my opinion, but I am on the radio, so I'm just going to say this. Uh, I would love to – our country is slowly – not even slowly anymore. It's drifting quickly into a more socialized uh, nation, more power at the top, less at the bottom, really weren't designed to be that way, much more of a federation. And I would love to see, I think if people get very excited with a Republican uh, platform that was focused on local decisions. Right. Now, the we, enculturations that go with being an individual state. Now we have also talked in in, uh, in recent uh, shows about how we we find uh, that uh, Donald Trump uh, has not been someone who has been uh, Christian and or conservative at all points in his life. Uh, so uh, and even now, even running, does this put him more on that conservative footing if he pledges to this platform? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a big great if. <laughs> question. Uh, that is a wonderful question, and I think there are, there are lots of opinions about that. Mm-hmm. About wh- because how on the Democrat gonna... side, they are working for what uh, one of the Democrat uh, plank writers have said was the most progressive platform they've ever had. Yeah, and that uh, and that they are all Clinton backers. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So yeah, it's fascinating. Going to see what happens because he has basically blown up the Republican Party. 
Trump. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's going to handle on the, on the plunger. TNT and he, and the I mean, it's happened. It's blown up. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't want their money. He still doesn't want their money. I mean, he's helping them. He's trying to – to. He's he knows really the down-ticket yeah. consequences of this. And so he's he's raising money now for the Republicans. But he's not raising money for his campaign. And, and he's also not spending a lot elsewhere. No. So he's still depending on free media, which – It's you know, the most fun- – I mean, he has blown this whole political process up. You know, and, and the things that we don't like about politics, you know, I mean, he really has thrown them a wrench in the gears. And uh, there's a there's a scramble now to try to figure out this convention is going to be fascinating. And I'm going to be sitting in my lazy boy watching this thing. It is going to be interesting to watch. As, well, this is this is like watching two strong men fight. Yeah, because you've got a guy who's running and who has the vote of the people behind him. Uh and he's going to be fighting a very strong and well entrenched government. What fun! And in many ways, it's an uphill battle uh, for he, this, right? Yeah, he's gotten more votes than any Republican has ever gotten. You know, in the primaries, the, the Cavaliers won the uh, world championship. You know? Really, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, more to come in just a moment on Faith Matters on our final segment here. I hope you'll stay around. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, Reverend Robert Cornegie and Bishop Doc Loomis. And we want to talk about an article that came out in the News and Observer, but it's about uh, Philadelphia Archdiocese. Uh, Philadelphia Archbishop, no communion for sexually active gay, unwed, or divorced couples. Uh, in this article written by David O'Reilly from the Philadelphia Inquirer, says, Divorced and civilly remarried Catholics, as well as cohabitating unmarried couples, must refrain from sexual intimacy to receive Holy Communion uh, in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Archbishop uh, Charles uh, Ch- Chaput. Is that how you say his name? Do you know? Uh, I think yeah. that's how he says it. Okay. Uh, has asserted in a new set of uh, pastoral guidelines. Released Friday, the guidelines instruct clergy and other uh, archdiocesan leaders uh, implementing uh, Morris Leticia, Leticia uh, uh, and a major document on family that Pope Francis issued in April. We talked about that back then. Um, now, uh, Doc, what do you think about uh, this? Is This teaching, as he descri- describes it as a hard teaching, is um, is not really unexpected from what we have seen from how Pope Francis himself has interpreted his own writings. Well, the Amoris is a very long document. It's some almost 400 paragraphs. Uh, it's about, I don't know, 100, 200 pages in a PDF format. Mm-hmm. And the Pope obviously labored over it for a long time. It's a very intense document. But it's not an encyclical, but it is. It well, does no, carry but it's, a lot it's, of weight, it's, so. it's very nearly so. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the next level underneath that. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, it was um, put together in consultation with with other bishops. and Including and, this bishop. Mark. Exactly. Right. And then um, there was a group given the task of um, kind of making it palatable for the average Catholic, the average Christian. And uh, then... I think the thing that the two things we need to know about this document are one, he's he's changing the conversation. He's looking at what's going on in the media. He's looking at what's going on in the courts and in different countries, and he's saying we're getting a little too we're having too many arguments about these issues of human sexuality and marriage and what love looks like. We need to have more grace because that's what God is filled with grace. And that we need to spend more of our time listening and accompanying people who are on their Christian or non-Christian journeys. And so he talks about accompanying people who have divergent lifestyles, mm-hmm. different views of marriages. It's a, so it's a big. It's showing love as an accompaniment document. The other thing that we need to be aware of is that he made when he when he wrote this. Uh, a, a number of people, columnists, Catholic reporters, began to view this as, well, the Pope's saying that the LGBT thing is okay. The Pope is saying that all this stuff is fine, that we didn't. We need to be less dogmatic. We need to be less, you know, mm-hmm. less morally specific, and we just need to live in the world of grace. That's not really what the Pope said, but there's an argument about it. 
So in an effort to clarify for his archdiocese, this is what Chaput has done. He's actually said, the Pope has given us, the archbishops and the diocesan bishops, the authority to interpret this for, their, for our own culture. So he's just making it clear for Philadelphia, this is how I interpret what the Pope says, and this mm-hmm. is how we're going to do this going forward. And it probably looks to you like a hard teaching, and it probably looks like the way you've always heard things are going to be. That's what I intend to be. That's how I intend to run this archdiocese. Well, yeah, one of the one of the uh, criticisms of of the uh, Amoris was that he said we are to be um, to not marginalize those who are in what they use the term irregular relationships the pope Mm -hmm. but at the same time the pope clearly stated that neither catholic teaching nor the camp canonical canonical discipline concerning marriage has changed Mm -hmm. so now what what this bishop for his um priest Mm -hmm. is saying that okay our attitude we need to have an attitude adjustment in this. We're being too critical. Can we, uh, uh, you know, hold to the teaching? How do you hold to the teachings of the church while welcome being a companion to those who are in these irregular relationships? Yeah, and he's really calling for, he's calling for a stopping. Of, he says there's been an incredible amount of pastoral time, which means church time, mm-hmm. uh, uh, denouncing an increasingly secularized and liberal world, right. and we've got to stop doing that. Let's try to let's let's let the church find new ways to help people approach true godly happiness. In other words, what we talk about here a lot. Let's ask the church to do its job. Yeah. Well, uh, and and again, in in the um, uh, with the mantle of grace, uh, and and in doing that, you say mm-hmm. accompanying people. I think of the part, some of the language is even walking alongside a very kind of pastoral sort of description of where you would be with someone who is not necessarily on that same um, understanding of uh, of what uh, the gospel tells us. Is uh, well, yeah, this is pro- this is what we face all the time. It's it's we're always there's always this tension between the wisdom of the world. And the wisdom of God. Mm-hmm. The world has a, a view of what is right, and God has made a revelation of what is right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and how do you how do you put those two together? And in many times you can't put them together. They, what you have to do, just as we were talking earlier in our earlier segment, we have to be proclaimers of the truth, and then the the world has to decide whether it's going to conform to that truth or not. We can't make them, and by, by attack, you know, as the Pope would say, um, attacking them or, or spending too much time mm-hmm. criticizing them, what we have to do is say, here it is. Here is how God has shown us to be in relationship with him. Mm-hmm. And these are the choices you have in doing that. And one of those is that, you know, you've got to – not do what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to trust and obey. The, um, that there's no other way <laughs> to be happy in Jesus, and but to trust, trust and, and obey. obey. Okay, all right. I'll finish the line. All right. So um, the arch uh, the Archbishop says uh, or did not discuss the guidelines according to this article. But the Reverend Dennis Gill, director of the Archdiocesan Office for Liturgy, described them Tuesday as much larger than communion and irregular relationships. And he goes on to speak about how applying all of Amoris to accompany married couples and also uh, to be companions of those who fall short of the church's teachings and guide them in holiness. And, and again, it's the, the Pope, if he, if he has expressed one theme, it's been the theme of grace. And this is, again, a, a as you said, 200-page exp- explanation of that, right? Yes, uh, it, it, and and Robert, you're also right. I mean, this is this is really a uh, the Amoris is really a religious brief on the same 
topics that Michael Brown brought up in his how we need to get along yeah. as uh, racially divided folks. This idea of, again, the devil being the great uh, disperser and the Lord being the great gatherer. And what he and what the Pope has said is we spent too much time trying to disperse people from the church and we need to spend more time trying to gather them and uh, and walk alongside. I don't think I answered your question, though, Ben, and no, it was a really good one, too. What was it again? <laughs> well, I, I think he is, uh, as you were just stated as well now, we are starting to see maybe this conversation going across different religious and ethnic lines about uh, a coming together under God's grace. Maybe uh, there is, uh, uh, as you uh, maybe are looking at a hopeful uh, future for that understanding. And even in politics, as we look at the discussion on Capitol Hill this past week of the, of the First Amendment Defense Act, uh, which a number of Republicans have signed off on, uh, but has been criticized. However, there have been those who in this, even in that discussion, are saying, no, we should not allow for people to be dismissed because of their religious views, be dismissed from their their local politics, like the um, uh, the the f- former Atlanta fire chief, Correct. Yes. So m- maybe these discussions we've gone through some pain of uh, experiences in our society that are leading to fruitful discussions. Well, I hope you're right. Uh, you know, all division stems from judgment. There's a judgment before there's a division, and uh, as Christians, it's a judgment we don't own, and that's what the Pope is saying. He's saying. Uh, let's let's not divide over our own personal judgments. And uh, in this country, we have this remarkable um, uh, this remarkable understanding of our faith as something that actually is to be protected and cherished. And uh, right now, people trying to live out their faith. Now we're spanning two stories here. I can feel us mm-hmm. stretching from one to the other. So I'll go with you. The we are. Uh, what we're feeling is that our our government is no longer protecting our right to believe as we as we do, at least from a faith standpoint, and uh, that to, is a stress that a lot of people are feeling yeah. right now. Or to practice those beliefs, and more than uh, just believing within the walls of the confines of your church, but to be actively engaged in your beliefs. Well, that and that was the um, that was the problem with you know we talked about it last week. We talked about in. Um, was it Iowa, Idaho, Iowa, Iowa, and and how the commission had made some restrictions and tried to apply restrictions to the church and what could be taught, and what uh, and mm-hmm. behavior within the church when they it was open to the public, and and they had to back off. Well, again, there was the, a lot of pushback. That's on the that. uh, speaking truth to power. Yeah, uh, has uh, sometimes has truth has some victories. Yeah, there too. So, again, we want to thank you for joining us uh, for another chapter of Faith Matters here on the Talk Station FM one hundred and seven and AM twelve forty. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Production of the Talk Station.